الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa taala and we ask Him to send His peace and blessings upon His messenger. Today's topic is a very important one, and many people might be surprised by that statement. That what is really the importance in looking after the environment. But one, when one really understands man's purpose in this life and the importance of looking after the environment, he will realize the importance of us as Muslims addressing this topic and being proactive when it comes to looking after the environment. Now, previously we've done quite a few seminars in giving dawah and the importance of giving dawah. But once a person has the information on how to give da'wah and what information he should be addressing, but if within his lifestyle or if within his character there are certain traits which are contrary to the teachings of Islam, then this will have a definite effect on the way a non-Muslim will look at an individual. To give a specific example, say there's a Muslim organization who has prepared an event like this. And there are some non-Muslims who are within the conference trying to make sure that everything is going according to plan. Now, during this conference we're talking about the importance of the environment, the importance of having Islamic characteristics. And yet, once we walk outside of the lecture theater, we see that the Muslims are dropping stuff on the floor, that the, uh, we're giving very little attention to uh, litter and these kind of things, this is going to have an effect on that individual. A person cannot be preaching Islam and yet his characteristics are very different to the thing that he is preaching. Uh, and this is just one of the reasons why we will be addressing this very important topic. And as you will be familiar with the timetable, we are, the key areas that we will be addressing in this short lecture is the Islamic law regarding the environment. Does the Quran and the Sunnah has, have anything to say with regards to the environment? The effects of our Islamic activities on the environment and wildlife. Is it possible that as Muslims we are doing certain things which is actually harming the environment. Uh, third, the priority of issues from an Islamic point of view. Uh, once we realize that looking after the environment is important, which are the key areas that we should pay, pay special attention to? Um, and finally, Muslims being proactive to promote and pursue ways of cultivating and preserving the environment. Uh, inshallah, these are some of the areas that we, um, Brother Sheikh Shabir Ali will be addressing. Uh, and with that, inshallah, I'll pass it on. But before I pass it on to him, an important announcement. Brothers, are, brothers and sisters are requested to switch off their mobile phones. We've had several complaints from brothers and sisters that during the lecture, um, some, some individual sitting next to, the, next to them is busy talking to someone else. And this is also causing a distraction to the speaker as well as the audience. So please switch off your mobile phones. Inshallah, once the talk is finished, you can switch it back on again. Zakhlaqah. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Someone suggested that my voice does not project well enough if I stand up, and obviously that's because I'm a little bit far away from the microphone. Can you brothers hear me all the way at the back there? Yes? And at the back over there? Oh, uh, wait a minute. Can you brothers hear me at the back? Yes? Great. Shukra. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasul al-Kareem. Amma ba. We begin by praising Allah Azza wa Jal. We ask Him to send peace and blessings upon His Prophets and Messengers, and especially upon the last of all of His Prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is the environment important for Muslims? And what should Muslims do in order to show the importance that they have for the environment? And where do we first of all derive the information from to conclude that the environment is of some importance to Muslims? Let us look at the Quran and the Sunnah which is our source of information to decide what constitutes the Muslim faith and practice. And what do we find there about the environment? To begin with, Allah Azawajal tells us in His glorious book that He created everything according to a measure, according 
ce crade. The word Qadr we all understand as representative of the sixth pillar of Iman. But the word Qadr is also a very comprehensive term. It refers to a measure. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 54, in Surah Al-Qamr, إِنَّا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَاهُ بِقَدَر Everything we have created with Qadr. Here we can understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything with a measure according to measured properties, characteristics to make sure that it is just right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made everything just right. Everything around us. And Allah invites us to examine what He has created and see if it is not so in fact. Just right. فَرْجِعَ الْبَاقَ Use the eyes to review. How karam in fatur? Look at the heavens. Do you see any uh, rift? Is there any fault? Allah has made it just right. So marji al basar. Review one more time. Have a look. This is in Surah 67, Surah Al Mulk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created things just right. Wa sama arafa'aha. Surah 55. وَغَدَعَ الْمِيزَانِ Allah has raised the sky and Allah has placed the mizan. What is the mizan? The balance. Again, in the Quran, a few words are used to include a lot of meaning. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said that he has been sent with جَوَامِ kalam, Comprehensive words. Not only in his own sayings, but in the Quranic text as well. More so in the Quranic text, comprehensive expressions. So Allah has established the balance. Allah taqaw fil mizan. So that you should not transgress the balance. So things are created in a balanced way. Everything according to a certain proportion. Now if we look around us, we see that human beings and the trees together form one part of that balance. Human beings exhale carbon dioxide, trees absorb carbon dioxide. Trees exhume carbon, uh, oxygen and human beings inhale oxygen. So trees and human beings together form a delicate balance. If human beings were to go cutting down, demolishing trees, then they are depriving themselves of the very oxygen that they need for their survival and for life. See, so there's a balance. And before we could discover this balance scientifically, the Book of Allah already 1400 years ago has told us that there is a balance, whether you know about it or not. Do not transgress that balance. So watch your steps. You might be transgressing that balance. You have to maintain that balance. So Muslims now realize that human beings are placed here on earth as representatives. The word Khalifa can be understood as one who comes after and it could also be understood as one who is a representative. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in his book that when he decided to create human beings or when he announced this to the angels Inni ja'ilun fil ardi Khalifa I am going to place a Khalifa upon the earth. What did the angels say? أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَا يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ Are you going to place on earth one who is going to corrupt the earth and shed blood? وَنَحْنُ نُقَدِّسُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ Whereas we, angels, are praising you and we are holy towards you. We are sincere towards you. We are sincere worshippers of you. So here the angels are wondering, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to create human beings. Now human beings have some obvious characteristics and their characteristics imply that certain things are going to happen. The angels can foresee. 
What's going to happen? Human beings are going to shed blood. And more to our topic, human beings are going to corrupt the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all of this in advance. He knows more than the angels. In fact, the angels got it from Allah. Because what do they say? La ilma lana illa ma allam tana. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of human beings, knows what he creates. Allah ya'lamu man khalaq. Doesn't he know what he creates? Of course he does. So knowing what human beings are capable of, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates them anyway. But he says, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know that which you do not know. Allah knows more than that. Allah knows that even though human beings will have the capacity to corrupt the earth, and to shed blood. And even though some human beings will do that, there will be among human beings those servants of Allah who choose to worship Him, to be sincere towards Him, to not shed blood, and to preserve the environment. So there are human beings who can in fact rise higher than the angels. The angels worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not having the choice to do wrong. Human beings, when they worship Allah having that choice so that they could have gone wrong, are more deserving of praise. These are a special creation of Allah If you have a piece of machinery that works very well, you might appreciate it, but you don't go say, oh, good piece of microphone, you know, very nice. But a child does something well, you praise that child. Because he could have done otherwise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by creating human beings now and putting them here on the earth is making them responsible for the environment, among other things. So now when he made human beings khalifa as it says here, it could be understood that they, they come to take over from what was there before. And it could also be understood that they have a responsibility with Allah and a special job to perform. Now the Quran talks about making human beings uh, khulafa, about establishing them on the land. What do Muslims hope for? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to establish Muslims on the land, what would we do? الَّذِينَ إِمَّكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَحْتَوَ الزَّكَاةَ وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنَهَوَانِ الْمُنْقَةِ if Allah were to establish Muslims on the land, what would Muslims do? They would establish the prayer, they would give the zakat. What else would they do? They would uh, enjoin what is right, and they would prevent what is wrong. They would do good things. So if Muslims were to have power, they should use that power not only to establish the salah and zakat, but in general, to ensure the good and welfare of human society. Remember what Sheikh Jafar Idris said, already put before us, that the entire Sharia has as its goal human welfare, coming under five categories. Preservation, protection of life, wealth, mind, faith, and nafil, progeny, or you can even understand that more broadly as honor. So pres preserving things for human beings, that is the goal of the Sharia. And the environment as we are seeing is also part of what human beings deserve to grow in, to flourish in, uh, to live in. So yes, Muslims do have a responsibility to the environment. Anything that is in a Muslim possession is not believed by the Muslim to be his very own. A Muslim understands that we are trustees of what we seem to possess. See, someone else like the Karun says, well, I worked hard, or I have intelligence, and because of my intelligence, I'm wealthy. The Karun of the modern day might say, I have a big shop, and because of my big shop, I'm wealthy. I worked hard to put this shop together. The Muslim says, no, it is from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim puts up a sticker in his home. He didn't need a sticker to say this. He needed to think this. But anyway, he puts a sticker that says, Hada min fadli rabbi. The sticker is right. It is exactly... His home is provided to him as a grace from his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is given to him for a time. He is only a trustee of it. 
In the Quran, in Surah Al Hadid, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us? Wa anfiku mimma ja'alakum mustaflafina fi. And spend out of what Allah has made you trustees of. So your wealth that you think is your own, that you work so hard for, is provided to you by Allah and given to you in trust. So that when He says, spend out of it, spend out of what He has made you trustees of. And people say, but wait a minute, after I worked hard and all of that, so you're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided this to me, didn't I get it from my work? Of course you got it from your work. But nothing works except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There is no power, no might, no ability, except with Allah azza wa jal. Now if you think for a moment how the system works. Imagine, uh, uh, let, let's think of a Muslim, and we always call him Zaid. I don't know why, but you know we say Zaid in Bakr. Huh? Uh, so let, let's call him Zaid. If there's any Zaid here in the room, I apologize for using your name so many times. Uh, so, Zayn has an old car, he hasn't started it for a while, and he doesn't think it might start. Uh, so he goes there and he thinks he better give it a try anyway, and uh, he puts his key in and he says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and he's really thinking now, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, right? And, you know, he, he turns that key and now even he's surprised, it starts. He says, Alhamdulillah. Now, if you ask an independent observer what happened here, he would tell you, Zayn went into the car and started his car. But if you ask Zayd what happened, Zayd will say, man, this old clunker couldn't start, but Allah started it for me. This Bismillah really works. And uh, Zayd drives his car now to his mechanic. And if you ask the mechanic what happened, the mechanic will tell you something about uh, ignition and uh, fuel and combustion and all of that. So now who is right? Is the independent observer right in saying that Zayd started his car? Or is Zayd right in saying that Allah started his car for him? Or is the mechanic right in describing the mechanical process? In fact, they are all correct. The independent observer is right because I did in fact go in and start his car. Didn't I say that myself? Yes, that's what I did. And Zayd is right because without Allah nothing clicks. You can have all the cars in the world, you can have all the fuel you want, but you wouldn't get from A to B without Allah Azawajal. You can turn that key for all you want, but it wouldn't click without Allah Azawajal. In fact, come to think of it, you couldn't turn a key without Allah Azawajal. You wouldn't have a key, you wouldn't have a car, and so on and so forth. So, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala <laughs> is the one who ensures everything. And the mechanic is also right, because what he is describing in fact, is the mechanical process, is the system of cause and effect, through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does things. So now, when you say, I went to work, and that's how I earned my money, actually you are just describing the system of cause and effect through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides you your money. So Allah is the one who provides it. So a Muslim believes that everything we have is given to us by Allah azza wa jal, and He has given it to us in trust, so that we should use it properly. So even our bodies is a trust, such that we should protect it, maintain it, keep it in good health. That's also part of being a good Muslim, being good to your own body. It's not that, okay, this is my body, I use it however I want to. And how do you read that your eyes have a right on you, meaning that you should get some sleep as well. Your body has a right on you, you should get some rest, and so on. The world in which we live is also a trust and we have to maintain that, we have to protect it such that it is used according to the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now we have come a far way now looking into the Quran and the Hadith text and we should ask ourselves, how does this compare with some thinking outside of Islam? What are people thinking then are their responsibility towards the environment? Let's ask the question very quickly. Why should anyone care for the environment if they are not a Muslim? Now one might give some good reasons. One might say, well, let's leave it for, uh, you know, protect the environment and leave it for the next generation. But if an atheistic philosophy is pursued, there's no good reason why one should want to leave it for another generation. In fact, in the first place, you have no guarantee that there is going to be another generation. In the second place, the atheistic philosophy is built on ideas which should not have anything to do with being good to others. There's no reason to be good to others if in fact an atheistic philosophy is what you pursue. 
you should be good to number one, yourself. So, if you can use the environment for all you want, waste it for all you can, destroy it, and who cares what, then that is exactly what you should do. But Islam now teaches us that there is a foundation for you to protect and maintain the environment, because now you are trustees of that environment. There is a thinking out there that we must uh, subdue the environment. We must conquer it. We must conquer nature. That is the function of human beings. And then on the opposite side of the scale, there is the thinking that you shouldn't try to conquer nature. That nature has as much right as human beings have. So animals have as much right as human beings have. So you shouldn't kill animals for food, for example. Because the animal has a right to life just as much as you have. How do we balance between all of these different philosophies? On the one hand, you have the one extreme that says you should conquer environment. On the other hand, you have the other extreme that uh, nature is just as good as human beings. And in Islam, you have the balance saying that we don't have to conquer the environment or conquer nature because nature has been created by Allah for our benefit, but at the same time, you cannot misuse it because it is a trust from Allah. So not on the one extreme of saying you have to conquer nature and not on the other extreme of saying that uh, nature has an equal value with human beings. Or sometimes it's even argued <laughs> further than that. So now, someone says, well you cannot kill animals for food because nature has an equal right. But where does this thinking come from? Who says? Or to put it another way, if Muslims are to kill animals for food, what gives them that right? When Muslims kill animals for food, they do that in the name of Allah. There's a philosophy behind that. What is it? Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. First of all, we don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim at this point. We normally say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, but at this point we say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Well, for one thing, the act of killing itself is not a merciful act. True? Let, let, let's admit that. But it becomes a necessary act for the protection and maintenance and survival of human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created animals for them to eat. But we kill these animals in the name of Allah, meaning that it is only by the permission of Allah that we can kill this animal for food. Otherwise, we have no right to kill an animal. You see the point? So now, when the environmentalist says, well no, you shouldn't kill animals even for food. Given their framework of reference, they are right. Given their uh, frame, uh, framework of reference, the human being and the ant is of the same value. In fact, according to the evolutionary hypothesis, ants are more successful at reproduction than human beings are. For every one human being on the face of planet Earth, there are hundreds of ants. I don't know what is, what is the ratio, but many, many more. So according to the evolutionary scheme, you shouldn't think that man is at the top of the evolutionary ladder. You should think that uh, evolution is not just simply a ladder, but a branching bush. Not even a tree, a branching bush. And man is just on a little side twig somewhere. But some other creatures are more successful at evolution than human beings. Ants are more successful. If we follow an atheistic philosophy then, Human beings are not worth more than bugs or bacteria. And so human beings would have no right to kill animals even for food. So they're right within their framework. They say, no, you cannot kill animals for food. You must be vegetarians. That is an extreme that we can avoid because we have a frame of reference that permits us to kill animals for food. What is that frame of reference? The fact that we are creatures of Allah and Allah has created things for our benefit that we should use with his permission. So yes, we can kill animals for food. In the name of Allah, meaning with the permission of Allah. And Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. 
You have power over this animal for the moment. You're about to slaughter it for your food. But do not forget that there is one who is more powerful than everyone else. There is one who is greater than all. That is Allah Azza wa Jal. So a Muslim in every action is taught his place in the cosmos. He's brought down to size. Everything is with a balance. Yes, you can kill this one for food by the permission of Allah, but do not forget that you are not the ultimate power, one greater than you. So you have to behave in a controlled manner. So that's the balance between the various extremes that are there. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, spoke about the, the rights of animals. In fact, one of the Muslim scholars in the 14th century, Ibn Abdul Salam, wrote the first book on the rights of animals. Did you know that? The Prophet وسلم, before this Muslim scholar already spoke about the rights of animals. Once he saw a camel uh, with its back bent and the Prophet ﷺ criticized the people who had treated the camel so. And he said, use the animals while they are healthy and retire them healthy also. It's not that you use them until you break their backs. Right? Again, you have permission to use these animals beasts of burden. But don't break their backs. Don't give them a job that is too much for them to bear. Now again, if we ask, can we use the animals as beasts of burden? If you follow an atheistic philosophy, the answer is no. Can you keep animals uh, um, to, to observe them? The, why in an atheistic philosophy? Human beings and chimpanzees are of the same worth. So human beings would have no right to keep chimpanzees for viewing, for example. And yet, despite that philosophy, that is done anyway. So Islam gives us that balance. We cannot cage an animal and deprive it of its freedom. We must allow that animal to go free if that animal like, loves freedom. If an animal is domesticated, it stays with you fine. We cannot hunt an animal for sport. You know, just for sport. You cannot use a live animal as target practice. Yes, you can hunt for your food, but not for sport. See, these are teachings that are already there in, in the sources of Islam, in the Quran and Sunnah for the last 1400 years. If Muslims have not practiced this, then this is our own fault. You know, in modern times, Muslims are known for a lot of other things than what Muslims really should be known for. When Abu Bakr an, was about to migrate to Habisha, you know, the Muslims were being persecuted in Mecca, true? They were migrating to Habisha, where they could live in peace and security. Muslims are not violent people. Muslims love peace. And they move away from the scene of violence. They avoid violence when they can. So Abu Bakr was also going to avoid this violence in Mecca, move away to the safety of Habisha. He wanted to live in peace. So the Muslim policy is to live and let live. But some people pursue the policy of live and let die. Abu Bakr is now migrating. Ibn ad dughunna one who later became a Muslim but at the time was not, said to Abu Bakr, you can't leave. You are the one who protects the widows. You look after the orphans. You help the needy. If you leave, who's going to do all of that? He said, no, 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 Abu Bakr, you stay and look, I'm going to offer you protection. Ibn ad dughunna was a big guy, you know. So the... The Arabs respected a tribal system where if somebody offers you protection, then that has to be honored. In other words, if they want to harm Abu Bakr, they have to first come to Ibn Abdul Ghunna. Right? He was a big guy. You don't mess with him. But the importance of this story is to show that Muslims, like Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, should be known to our non-Muslim neighbors as people who are good to have around. Because they do things in society. They help the widows. They look after the orphans. They treat the needy well. Uh, they look after the environment. They plant trees. They look after uh, animals. They help other people. This is what Muslims should really be known for. And if you we were following the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, we would be known for all of this. 
Because he encouraged us to give sadaka. And usually we think of sadaka as writing a check. That's easy for you know, a person in this country who has a nice paycheck, right? You can easily write a check. But do something with your hands. Involve yourself in sadaka. And one of the ways you can do that is by planting a tree. Did you realize that? There is a hadith which actually says that if, uh, if a first person plants a tree in which the birds come to nest, and the animals eat from it, the fruits, and people come and shade under it, then there is a sadaka for all of this. It is a sadaka, a charity for you. And I want to thank the other speakers who are part of this conference because I've been picking their brains to prepare for this uh, lecture. It's the first time I'm delivering a lecture on this uh, subject, and uh, they have been tremendously helpful to me. And in fact, um, uh, Brother Anwar al just uh, handed me this uh, hadith on my way in. So this is just like the last late-breaking news. Huh? Just just on my way into the studio, I have this uh, late breaking news to share with you. Narrated by Imam Ahmed, whoever plants a tree and has patience in protecting and nurturing it until it grows up and bears fruits, Allah would grant him the rewards of sadaqa for every fruit that is taken from it. That's sadaqa. Plant a tree. There's a hadith in which it is related that if the, if the hour comes, you know the hour refers to the last Day. But you know, that's a protracted thing. That's, that's not like everything instantaneous. Huh? So the hour comes, and if you have a seedling ready to plant it, and if you're able to finish planting it before the hour overtakes you, go ahead and plant it. A lot of people think that Muslims are fatalistic. But in fact, Muslims are people who do things. Yes, we do things. The idea that the day of judgment is going to come does not stop Muslims from doing something for this world. There is a narrative which says that if you work for this world, work as if you're going to live forever. And when you work for the hereafter, work as though you're going to die tomorrow. So work for the hereafter as though you're going to die tomorrow. But work for this world as though you're going to live forever. So our vision for the life after death does not stop us from seeing what is here. It's just that we have a broader, long range vision. We see into the light hereafter. The rest of our comrades just see the immediate things of this world. And they love the world more than they love the hereafter. But the Muslim sees the whole thing. You know, if you look far ahead, then you'll catch the entire focus. Or your, your, if your focus is far ahead, you'll see everything in the background. You know, this was one of my first tips when I learned to, to drive many years ago. A driving instructor said, Shabir, just look far ahead. I thought I just had to look over that bonnet, you know. This is a bonnet and I'm just... <laughs> said, no! Look far ahead! As far as you can see. And you'll see everything else. That's what the Muslim is about. He looks far ahead into the life hereafter. That's what he wants. That's his goal. But everything else comes in the periphery of his vision. He doesn't lose sight of what's around him. So yes, we have to care for that which is around us. It starts with caring for our own bodies. <clears throat> it continues into caring for our families. Because our families also have a right on us. Come to a Muslim conference, we get all fired up and we go back and we say, no, don't have time for the family because now I'm a man for the hereafter. No. <laughs> No monasticism in Islam. Live with your families. Have time for them. Look after animals. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ criticized a woman who had caged a cat. Not feeding the cat and not allowing the cat to go out and find grub for itself. Said that this woman is one of the dwellers of hell. On the contrary, there is a story of a man who saw a dog, thirsty, went down into a well, took up some water with his shoes, and brought it to quench the thirst of this dog, a man of paradise. Somebody asked the Prophet ﷺ, Messenger of Allah, is there a, a reward for kindness to animals? He said, yes, there is a reward for every moist liver. For any animal that you, that you give some food to, some drink to, there is a reward for that. Protecting the animals, looking after the environment around us. 
There are instructions in hadith and in the books of fiqh that Muslims should not urinate in stagnant water. Do you realize that? You know, some people who are on school, on train, on food, on civilized, will go, you know, urinate in any corner. But the Muslim has to do things in a civilized, in a practical, and in a wise manner. His actions are measured. So he doesn't urinate in the stagnant water. Now if people were practicing the philosophy in which this is based, they would realize that stagnant water too has to be protected, has to be maintained, has to be kept as pure as it can be. You cannot pollute stagnant water. You cannot urinate in places where people gather or where people pass. You cannot urinate on the root of a tree because you might harm that tree. These are in the Islamic teachings. And people wonder, you know, does Islam have rever uh, relevance for modern times? And the answer to that is absolutely. So now, I want to wrap this talk up very quickly because I want to get uh, leave time for your questions. But I want to move on and ask then. Suppose we were to leave Islam aside and ask, if it weren't for Islam, why should we be good to the environment? What do we have? And why, why is the environment in so much trouble today? Well, people have been damaging the ozone layer, not intentionally, you know, we use all these chlorofluorocarbons and so on, and it goes off, it damages the ozone layer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it without any risk, and so Allah invited us to look at how he has made it. But we have done it to ourselves. What does the Quran say? ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس Fasad, corruption, has occurred on land and sea because of the works of the hands of humankind. Because of what the hands of humankind have worked. What they have earned. It's by our own doing. You know, we go around spraying the chlorofluorocarbons. We have all the air conditioning and everything like that. We use and we abuse. We have caused the corruption in land and sea. And now we're seeing even in the ozone layer. And that is harming ourselves. Now, if one were to ask, well, uh, suppose we decide, let us be so caring for the environment, even to the extent of limiting our own needs. So we can do without some of this stuff. You know, the selfish individual says, well, why should I give it up? And now we're in what is called in philosophy the prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma. You know, if one rats on the other one, then uh, he gets to go free. If he doesn't rat and they both confess, then, you know, they get a lighter sentence. If one confesses and the other one doesn't confess, the one who doesn't confess gets a terrible punishment. The one goes free. So what happens? Both of them confess. But if they didn't confess, the case against them would not be proved. They would both have to go free. So if they didn't confess, both would go free. If one confesses, he goes free or gets a lighter punishment. So he says, let me take my lighter punishment and confess. So both of them end up confessing and both get the lighter punishment. If they didn't confess, both would go free. But each one confesses, fearing that if he didn't confess and the other one did, he would get a stiff one. So now we're in a prisoner's dilemma. Thinking, you know, if I didn't do it, somebody else will do it. So if I don't harm the environment, somebody else will harm the environment, so I may as well go ahead and harm the environment. It'll harm me too, but that's the dilemma I'm in. If everybody decides not to harm the environment, we'll be okay. But if some people go ahead and harm the environment, okay, uh, anyway, then I'm going to be harmed too. So I may as well go ahead, eat, drink, and be merry, harm the environment as well, it'll harm me as well, but who cares? There's nothing I can do about it. So once this philosophy goes about of selfishness, where everybody decides for himself, one says, why should I then do something about the environment, whereas in fact the environment is going to be corrupt anyhow? But you have a reason. You have a reason because you follow the book of Allah. You follow the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that should be done in its own right. It doesn't matter if everyone else commits corruption on the earth. It doesn't matter if everyone else rapes, kills and steals. 
You as a Muslim have a responsibility before Allah to do what is right regardless of what anybody else is doing. So you are not in that prisoner's dilemma. You are in submission to your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the rest of the people are in that dilemma. I should throw my garbage about because if I didn't throw my garbage about, somebody else is going to throw his garbage and the place is going to be filthy anyhow. So why not throw the other piece of garbage? What difference is that going to make? It makes a difference if you do not throw your garbage. It makes a difference between you and your Lord. That is the point. Never mind what everyone else has done. You do the right thing. You have something and a reason for doing the right thing. Others may not have that. One of the uh, ways in which people have um, corrupted our environment is to be summed up in a single word wastefulness wasting and Muslims are told in the Quran not to waste kulu washrabu wa la tusrifu inna allaha la yuhibbul musrifin eat and drink but do not be wasteful Allah does not like the people who are wasteful again the Quran says in the surah um, Isra wa la tubadhir tabdira do not be wasteful in your spending إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ Surely the wasteful, the spendthrifts are the brothers of the devil or of the devils كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ So do not be wasteful Surah 17, Ayah number 27 Easy to remember, right? 17 and 27 <laughs> Let your brains work on that So we cannot waste. Now if everyone else is wasting again, if everyone is, is you know, eating half the plate and throwing away the other half, if everyone you know, gets this burger in uh, multiple packaging and, uh, and, and throws away all that packaging, all of that building up and uh, getting mankind buried in our own garbage, Muslims have a reason to say, well, no, wait a minute. That's not right. I don't have to do it that way. I don't have to waste. I myself... For my own sake, and for the sake of Allah, can decide not to waste. So I'm not going to be a spendthrift, I'm not going to be wasteful, I'm going to live within my means, I'm going to live in such a way that while looking after my own interests, I do not harm the interests of the environment and of nature around me. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum. So there should be some paper being passed around soon, so... We'll also take questions from the floor. We'll take questions from the floor as well. Um, the brothers with the microphone on Tehran, but if you could say a question, I'll try and repeat it and then we'll address it to the speaker. The question is that what is the Sheikh's position with regards to visiting zoos? I haven't studied the position. I, I don't have an answer for that. The question is, what's the position with regards to genetically modified food? Well, if, if some genetic modification can work for the benefit of human beings, uh, then um, I don't see any harm in that. And uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the shiukh of Islam have not um, ruled against that. Um, if something is harmful, then naturally it will contradict with the maslaha, which is the objective of the sharia, and then there will be a ruling against it. Is there a question from this side? Since we have a brother with a microphone. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just want to ask, what's the ruling with regards to joining organizations such as Greenpeace? Okay. They, uh, any, anyone who is uh, working for good, um, we should cooperate with them. What does the Quran tell us? Ta'awunu ala al-birri wa taqwa. That you should uh, cooperate in bir and taqwa. Bir is a very general term. It refers to kindness, goodness, uh, and so on. Uh, so if anyone is working for something which is good, then uh, we can join with them, so long as we do not harm ourselves or harm them in, in such a uh, type of cooperation. We cannot cooperate with someone who is uh, doing wrong, but uh, we can uh, cooperate with someone in the good things that we do. 
and in fact Muslims should be at the forefront in, in things like this in the talk I didn't have time to uh, try and, and offer some suggestions on what can be done for the, for the environment but here is a suggestion that is offered in the form of a question um, there's a question right at the back there's a brother at the back with the raised hand but before he goes to him at the back was there anyone at the back here? the last row I'll read this question first Surely the state of the area around the university is, an evidence, is enough evidence against us. Um, okay, it says please remind Radio 5 Live, do not upset the balance. I don't really get that. Do you see what mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, probably... Um, uh, food. The, uh? the food? Uh, please remind me uh, read Radio S live. Maybe they're referring to my comments about this coming in late. You know, mm. Okay, so there is a suggestion here. Yeah, let, let's uh, be very conscious of our environment while we're here at this conference. Don't litter about you. Don't let someone walk in here and say, oh, Muslims are here and they're filthy. It wouldn't be fair if they said that because it's, it's natural that when people congregate together in as large crowd as we are, there is going to be some garbage around and so on. As much here as we sit and we talk about the importance of environmentalism and so on, we cannot expect that everyone is going to, to act according to the rules all of the time. So there's going to be some things. I'm not encouraging it and I'm not justifying it. I hope you don't get that impression. But I'm encouraging you to clean up after yourself. But at the same time, uh, it would be unfair if someone were to come and pass that negative judgment based on what they, they observe around here. But let us walk so straight that even the enemies cannot say you went out of line. Okay? So try your best to clean up around you. If you notice something that shouldn't be there, pick it up and put it in its right place. That is what a Muslim does. He puts things in their right places and he does not displace things. Question in the back. Assalamu alaikum. Is it permissible to experiment on animals for the benefit of man eventually? Um, I, I didn't hear it fully. Is it permissible to experiment on animals, what? Uh, for the eventual benefit of mankind, you know, like uh, finding a medicine or a cure for cancer, etc. Mm. Okay, now, again, we, we do not per pursue ideas in extreme forms. We try to pursue things with balance, with wisdom, uh, and, um, and with justice. So we have some permission to use animals. We use them normally as beasts of burden. We have permission in our religion uh, to uh, slaughter for food and, and so on. So now the, is a, there's a modern question. Can we uh, do testing on animals in order to find cures for cancer and so on to um, look after human being welfare? And, uh, and the answer to that has to be that in a balanced and reasonable way, yes. We cannot go to extremes and torture animals and, and uh, test them beyond necessity and, and use all kinds of chemicals on them uh, that uh, you know, decimate large populations of animals and so on. But in some reasonable and controlled manner, yes. And uh, human wisdom can kick in to say what's reasonable at a time. And through public discussions and forums, we can hear the issue being debated. Someone can say, oh, well, it looks like this is too excessive, and we can find out what exactly they, they mean by that, and what, why do they think it is so. And someone else justifies it and says, no, it's not excessive, it is necessary because uh, so many humans are dying of this, this disease, and we need to find a cure for that disease. This is a reasonable way of proceeding to find a cure. If we didn't do it this way with the animals, we'd have to do it on human beings, and human beings would die as a result. So in order to prevent the loss of human life, uh, we are taking the lesser of two evils by, in a controlled way, testing on animals, even though some animals may die or may be harmed by this, it is saving a greater harm. So we're looking at the lesser of two evils, which is one of the principles of the Sharia as well. But we should not use this kind of argument to justify um, misusing animals. Like, for example, people use uh, uh, test cosmetics on animals, where, whereas these cosmetics are not necessary. You know, medicine is necessary, of course, but cosmetics are not. You have so many ways of beautifying yourselves. Uh, why, you know, come up with new things that has to be tested on animals, uh, whereas these were not necessary and they're harmful to animals? Question from the front. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, recently, there's some articles in the news, in the newspapers, that in a couple of years they think that they're going to be able to use pigs' hearts as transplant for human beings. And I was just wondering if you knew about our Islamic ruling on that. 
Mm. Okay, this is a question not so much about uh, environmentalism, but um, you know about the, the question of whether transplants can be used and so on. And uh, this, to answer this question needs some training in the Sharia, which I don't have. So I'd rather leave that for some of the other speakers, perhaps tonight in the panel discussion. If you were to raise that again, we can have an answer to that. And to be fair, yes, your question does in fact relate to environmentalism as well, because it, it means we'd have to get the heart of the animal to use it on a human being. Um, it, but in that case, it will, I think that part of it has already been answered because if we have to choose between uh, two evils, uh, we, we choose the lesser of the two evils. So there is some scope to say, okay, if an animal has to be sacrificed for the preservation of a human life, uh, then this can be done. All right. Can we have a question? When you say to protect all animals, what about pigs? Mm. Yeah, well, when we say all animals, you know, we have to have some limitation on the all here because some animals are in fact harmful to human beings and Muslims have permission to kill the animals which are harmful to them. In fact, even while a Muslim is in ihram, which uh, means that he cannot kill animals, even then too he has some permission to kill the animals who can be harmful to human beings. So, um, the question now is about pigs. Well, I'm not sure that there is anything in our Sharia that says we should harm pigs. We just don't rear pigs, we don't have anything to do with them, we don't eat them at all. Other communities may have that, and, and this, is, uh, this is their business, how they help to look after the pigs. But Muslims, I, I'm not sure that Muslims are told in anything that they should harm pigs. Is anybody aware of that, that Muslims should harm pigs? No. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the hadith of Isa alayhi salam that he will, towards the end times he will kill the pigs, he will break the cross. Uh, this is referring to something that we'll have to see what is meant by that when he does it. What exactly is meant by Isa alayhi salam breaking the cross and killing the pig? Um, and uh, furthermore, what he will do, he will do with special permission that is given to him by Allah azza wa jal. So that is not something that uh, gives a command to us to do this or that. Should we stop using cars and other polluting forms of transport? Hmm. Well, again, we have to pursue things with reason and, and balance. Uh, to, to say, let's stop using cars because it is harm, harming the environment might be too much of a drastic change. And, and you see, when, when a ship is, is, is going in a certain direction, if you want to change direction, you cannot just immediately make a right turn. It takes a while to navigate yourself around into a neat little curve. And uh, in a similar sense, if we discover now that cars are harmful to the environment, uh, well then, um, uh, we, we cannot stop everything we're doing and say, okay, no more cars. But we can introduce measures to, to reduce the amount of, um, of waste that we're emitting um, through these vehicles. By, for, for example, limiting the, the amount of use we put cars to. If we can carpool, for example, that would be a good thing. And you know, a Muslim, when he does something good, he expects reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. So he has an added incentive to do something which is good. You see, your, your contemporaries can only say, well, let us, for the sake of the environment, uh, you know, carpool. And one morning he's waking up and thinking, well, do I really have to do that? Um, but, you know, the Muslim says, well, you know, I look forward to life everlasting with Allah Azza wa Jal. It might be a little bit inconvenient to do this thing, which is a good thing for the environment, but if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with me doing this thing, this is the greatest thing in the world, so let me do it. So he has an added incentive to do that. So yes, we can look for ways to reduce the, the amount of toxic waste that we, that we exhume. Do we have a question from the floor? Okay, we'll take a written question. In many parts of the world, goats, sheep and even cows are castrated to enhance meat volume. No. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. In many parts of the world, goats, sheep, and even cows are castrated to enhance meat volume or output. Is this acceptable? Okay, this uh, question again, I would like to refer to the panel tonight. Um, and, and I hope we'll get an answer concerning the Sharia, uh, from, from the Sharia regarding that. Mm -hmm. Can you encourage the Muslims to recycle the paper and glass, etc.? Well, yes, of course. Uh, you know, the idea of reducing, uh, reusing, and recycling. Uh, these are all in, under the general category of, uh, of um, not wasting. And so not wasting means uh, reduce your use. It means also uh, reuse what you can. 
And it means recycle what you can, yes. Uh, so if you can recycle glass and recycle paper and so on, all this is good. These are resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us with. We should not waste them. Okay, I think we're going to end it there. Um, the next session will be at 6 o'clock, the responsibility of raising and educating children. So all the brothers or sisters are requested to turn up on time. Jazakallah khair. There wasn't really any questions here.